Kia ora team, welcome back to the 2.4 video series. This is video number 7. In this lesson you'll be learning about the factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis and cellular respiration, and you'll be learning about the similarities and differences between photosynthesis and cellular respiration. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to discuss the factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis and cellular respiration, and describe the similarities and differences between photosynthesis and respiration. So limiting factors are an essential resource that is in least supply or availability. And the rate of any reaction or process will always correspond to the factor which is in least supply, the limiting factor. In the 2.4 achievement standard, you must be aware of the limiting factors that can affect the rate of the following processes, photosynthesis, cellular respiration, DNA replication, and mitosis. This video will be covering those in photosynthesis and respiration, and there will be a future video on DNA replication and mitosis. So let's start with the factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis. All of the reactants required for photosynthesis, such as light, water, and carbon dioxide, are all factors that can affect the rate of photosynthesis. So chloroplast number and distribution can also affect the rate of photosynthesis, and the time of day can also affect it as well, because it's linked to sunlight and temperature. And finally, any factor that affects enzyme function, like temperature, pH, enzyme concentration, substrate concentration, inhibitors, and cofactors and coenzymes will affect the rate of photosynthesis, because the light-dependent and light-independent reactions are all catalyzed by enzymes. And finally, Nutrient availability is also up on that list because many nutrients are actually coenzymes and cofactors to enzymes that are in photosynthesis. So let's look at some of these factors in more detail. Let's look at carbon dioxide first. Carbon dioxide is one of the raw materials needed for photosynthesis because it provides carbon and oxygen atoms that are needed to make glucose, making it an important limiting factor that can affect the rate of photosynthesis. If the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is low, like down here, the rate of photosynthesis will also be low. It doesn't matter how much sunlight or water is available, if carbon dioxide concentration is low, the rate of photosynthesis will also be low. There won't be enough carbon and oxygen atoms to make glucose. If the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increases, there will be more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to diffuse into the leaves of the plant. This increases the rate of photosynthesis up to a maximum point, which is about here. If the carbon dioxide continues to increase past this maximum point, the rate of photosynthesis will level off, like this plateau you can see here in the diagram. This is because other factors, like the availability of sunlight, become limiting factors. No matter how much carbon dioxide is available for plants to absorb, the other factors involved in photosynthesis also need to increase to bring about a further increase in the reaction rate. Now let's look at water. Water is also one of the raw materials needed for photosynthesis because it provides the hydrogen molecules needed to make glucose. If there's a lack of rain or plants are not watered regularly, then the soil can dry out. This means water can no longer diffuse from the soil into the roots by osmosis, and the rate of photosynthesis will decrease. This is because there will be less hydrogen, so fewer glucose molecules will be formed. And that's why the leaf is coated on the outer side with a waxy cuticle, to prevent or reduce transpiration, which is also known as water loss, which would decrease the rate of photosynthesis. Specialized guard cells that open and close stomata on the underside of leaves also function to control that movement of gases and control the rate of transpiration. And as the amount of water increases in the soil, the rate of photosynthesis will increase to a certain point, but after that, the increase in water won't make an increase in photosynthesis anymore. That's because other factors like light availability will become limiting. Now let's talk about light intensity and wavelength. Light is an important resource for photosynthesis. Light's absorbed by chlorophyll and provides the energy that's needed to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And similar to carbon dioxide, increasing light intensity or increasing brightness of light will increase the rate of photosynthesis to a maximum point at about here. Above this maximum point, 
any further increases in the light intensity will have no effect on the rate of photosynthesis like this plateau here and will eventually level off as other factors like temperature or the concentration of chlorophyll molecules will become limiting. It's also important to note that different wavelengths of light provide different amounts of energy. Now let's talk about chloroplast structures. There are several structural features of chloroplasts that maximize the rate of photosynthesis. We're going to talk about five of these. So the first is the stroma, which is the fluid containing enzymes and water and is the site for the light independent reactions. It's clear and it's transparent. This means that the stroma doesn't block out the light and so the light can reach the chlorophyll. The second point we need to talk about is the increased numbers of flattened thylakoids containing chlorophyll. This increases the surface area for absorbing light. Number three, the chloroplasts themselves can move within the cell. They can distribute themselves within the cell in response to light availability. When the light is intensity is low, chloroplasts move in order to get more light. This also gives chloroplasts an equal access to light intensity. And as a result, the chloroplasts and thylakoid absorb more total light energy that splits water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen, and this increases the rate of photosynthesis. Now, in extreme light conditions, the high light intensity can actually damage chloroplasts, so they move to adjust or reduce their light exposure. The fourth point is that plants that are in shade have bigger chloroplasts than plants that are exposed to full sun. This is because bigger chloroplasts have a larger surface area, allowing them to have more chlorophyll exposed to light at any one time. Whereas non-shade plants don't have large chloroplasts because enough light is being provided for them. And finally, the location of cells containing most chloroplasts, so the palisade cells, are found near the top of the leaf. These palisade cells are packed tightly against each other to maximize the number of chloroplast filled cells that are at the top of the leaf. The chloroplasts are also pushed up against the cell wall by a large vacuole to minimize the diffusion distance for essential molecules like carbon dioxide and water to reach chloroplasts. Now let's talk about enzymes. We need optimum conditions for enzymes to catalyze these reactions in photosynthesis because remember that all of the reactions involved in photosynthesis are controlled by enzymes and remember that enzymes can only function in a specific range of conditions. Each type of enzyme that's associated with photosynthesis has a unique range of temperature in which they can function and within this range there's a specific temperature where the rate of photosynthesis will be the fastest. This is called the optimum temperature. Normally, an increase in light intensity leads to an increase in temperature. When it's a really um, sunny day, it's also going to be a really hot day. If the temperature increases ever so slightly, it increases the kinetic energy of enzymes and substrates that causes them to move faster. This causes them to collide more frequently and increasing the rate at which the enzymes and substrates can bind together at the active site. So this will increase the rate of photosynthesis. Now generally, warmer temperatures are better than colder temperatures of photosynthesis because this means that enzymes can collide more with the substrates because they have more kinetic energy and more chemical reactions can occur. But if the temperature gets too high, the rate of photosynthesis may decrease or stop completely. This is because the enzyme may lose its shape and denature, resulting in the active site changing shape and no longer being able to fit the substrate. And as a result, the chemical reactions would stop completely and the rate of photosynthesis will decrease or stop completely also. But if the temperature gets way too low, the enzymes and substrates will have less kinetic energy. And this means they will move much slower and the frequency of the enzyme and substrate collisions will decrease. This will cause the rate of photosynthesis to also decrease. The time of day and the season, winter or summer, also affects the rate of photosynthesis because the time of day and the season determines the light intensity and the temperature. The rate of photosynthesis is greater at midday, so about noon, and early morning or evening, and there's little to no photosynthesis at all at night, whereas the rate of photosynthesis is greater in the summer months compared to the winter months. 
And finally, nutrient availability affects the rate of photosynthesis. So soil is a major source of nutrients for plants. They need to absorb essential nutrients like potassium, nitrogen, magnesium to support healthy cellular processes and growth. Now nutrients have to be dissolved in water for plants to use them because they're taken up by the root hair cells found on the roots of plants. And unlike water and carbon dioxide, the concentration of nutrients in the soil is much lower than inside the plant. You can think of it as the plants hoarding all the nutrients and trying to take up as much nutrients as possible from the soil. And so they can't take up nutrients by osmosis or diffusion. Instead, they have to use active transport to move these nutrients into the plant cells. And this active transport needs energy because nutrients are being moved against their concentration gradient. So why are these nutrients so important? Well, for example, potassium is a cofactor for enzymes. Nitrogen is used to make amino acids. Magnesium is used to make chlorophyll and amino acids are used to synthesize enzymes. Now let's look at the factors that can affect the rate of cellular respiration. These factors can fall into three categories, the state of the cell, limiting molecules, and factors that affect enzyme activity. So let's start off with the state of the cell. Now cells that are highly active have a high rate of cellular respiration. This means that whenever the rate of chemical reactions in a cell increases, the rate of respiration will also increase to produce more ATP to carry out those heightened levels of chemical reactions. So for example, liver cells um, have a job of breaking down and removing toxic substances from the blood. And for this, they need ATP to do all these chemical reactions. For example, a common toxic substance that the liver needs to break down and get rid of is alcohol. When people consume alcohol, their liver works extra hard to break down these alcoholic molecules. And so therefore, the, res and therefore the cellular respiration is increased in the liver and they're going to need more ATP. What about growth? Growth during childhood and puberty also increases the rate of respiration. And growth occurs due to the process of cell division called mitosis. Now mitosis is a process that uses ATP. So during growth, cells need more ATP, which increases the rate of cellular respiration. Now growth is a particularly important factor affecting the rate of cellular respiration in plants. For example, young growing leaves use more ATP than old leaves that don't need to grow anymore. And growing stem tips are more likely to use ATP than older branches. And also fruits that are developing use a lot more ATP as they grow and ripen. The areas where the plant is growing has a higher level of cellular respiration because more ATP is needed to fuel the reactions for them to grow. And healing and repair. So respiration rates can also be increased when cells are healing from damage or infection. In both animal and plant cells, the healing process requires ATP. The more ATP needed for healing, the higher the rate of respiration. So if you have any cuts or any scratches on your skin, these areas will be respiring more than the skin around them. Now let's look at limiting molecules. So glucose, for example, is required for both aerobic and anaerobic respiration. When cells have limited access to glucose, their rates of respiration will decrease. Oxygen. Aerobic respiration needs oxygen. So when oxygen levels are low, the reactions of the Krebs cycle and electron transport chain will be restricted. And lactic acid. Lactic acid reduces the rate of respiration because it lowers the pH of the cell and it can cause enzymes to denature. So when enzymes are denatured, they can't catalyze the reactions any longer. And until the lactic acid is broken down and gotten rid of, the pH of the cell will still remain low and respiration will be limited. And finally, enzyme activity. Any factors affecting enzyme activity will affect the rate of respiration. So we've talked about temperature and pH before, so I want to focus on inhibitors for now. Enzyme activity can be lowered by the presence of inhibitors, and the common inhibitors are heavy metals like cadmium. These bind to enzymes and prevent them from binding to their specific substrates. So for example, cadmium can combine with the active site of enzymes, blocking it or changing its shape, and it prevents substrates from attaching it to it 
and a product being formed. So this prevents the enzyme functioning correctly and it is irreversible. Finally, I'd like to go through the similarities and differences between photosynthesis and respiration. There are five important similarities. Similarity number one, the structure of organelles. So the organelles where these processes occur have major similarities. Mitochondria and chloroplasts both have double membranes, which are filled with a nutrient-rich fluid. In chloroplasts, this is the stroma, and in mitochondria, this is the matrix. They also both contain structures that have a high surface area to maximize the space available for reactions. In chloroplasts, this is the flattened stacks of thylakoid membranes, and in the mitochondria, this is the highly folded cristae of the inner membrane. Similarity number two are the enzymes. Both photosynthesis and cellular respiration require complex chains of chemical reactions that need to be catalyzed by enzymes. Remember that enzymes catalyze reactions by lowering the activation energy that's needed for a reaction. So this also means that the rate of both photosynthesis and cellular respiration are affected by factors that affect enzyme activity. This includes pH, coenzymes, and inhibitors like heavy metals. Similarity number three are the molecules involved. So photosynthesis and respiration are opposite reactions to one another. So both reactions involve the same molecules, glucose, carbon dioxide, um, water, oxygen, and ATP. Similarity number four is that they both produce ATP. Both processes include chemical pathways that produce ATP. During photosynthesis, a small amount of ATP is produced during the light-dependent phase, whereas during respiration, the majority of ATP is produced during the electron transport chain, but some is also produced in glycolysis. And finally, similarity number five is the conversion of energy. Both processes convert one form of energy to another. Photosynthesis converts light energy into chemical energy, which is stored as glucose. Whereas respiration converts chemical energy stored in glucose into a different form of chemical energy, ATP, that cells can use. And finally, photosynthesis and cellular respiration have five major differences. Difference number one are the organelles. A major difference is that chloroplasts are found in plant cells only, so animal cells cannot photosynthesize whereas mitochondria are found in both plant and animal cells, so both plants and animals can carry out aerobic respiration. Difference number two are the limiting factors. The reactants and products of each process are opposite, so the concentrations of these molecules affect the rate of each processes differently. For example, low carbon dioxide and low water will limit the rate of photosynthesis because carbon dioxide and water are reactants. But low levels of carbon dioxide or water won't affect cellular respiration because it's a product. Similarly, low levels of glucose will limit the rate of respiration because it's a reactant, but low levels of glucose won't have an effect on photosynthesis because they're a product. Difference number three, the reactants and products. Although photosynthesis and respiration use many of the same molecules, these molecules play very different roles in each of the processes as I described previously. In photosynthesis, carbon dioxide and water are the reactants used to produce glucose and oxygen, which are the products. In respiration, glucose and oxygen are the reactants that are used to create ADP, carbon dioxide and water as products. This is why these processes are often said to be opposite of each other. Difference number four, sunlight and when it occurs. So photosynthesis needs light energy from the sun, which is captured by chlorophyll. This means that photosynthesis can occur during the daytime, but because respiration doesn't need light, it can occur day and night, all the time. And finally, difference number five is enzyme activity. While the complex reactions in both processes are catalyzed by enzymes, the reactions the enzymes catalyze are different. During photosynthesis, enzymes primarily build larger molecules like glucose from smaller molecules like carbon dioxide and water. This is an anabolic reaction. During respiration, enzymes primarily break down larger molecules like glucose to form smaller molecules like water and carbon dioxide. This is a catabolic reaction. 
Kapai, you've reached the end of the video. So by now you should be able to discuss the factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis and discuss the factors that affect the rate of respiration. And you should also be able to describe the similarities and differences between photosynthesis and respiration. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.